Welcome to the Practice Podcast, conversations probing the nature of practice. I'm your host, Dave Firon. Bob Rufloff, I have so many things that I would say in this introduction that it would go too long and you wouldn't get to the wonderful meat of what his practice life is now and what it looks like it's going to be for a long time to come. But I did characterize it right up front in the conversation as a student. That's his, that's his label. I label him as a student when he was my student years ago and today, and I think he's going to continue to be a wonderful student for, on behalf of his com- company, Impact, and also just because he wants to live that kind of life, a life of learning and growing. The life that Peter Vale and I envisioned when we set forth these podcasts and then the book on practice as a way of being. So with that plug, <laughs> let me uh, take you right to our conversation. This is Bob Ruffalo. Well, I was trying to find in my mind uh, a label to place on Bob Ruffalo. Well, I think probably the honorific label would be former student of David S. Fearon. <laughs> but that's how I remember uh, Bob at any point in his career and mine. As I look back on several students who had more of it <laughs> uh, than others were able to reveal in my various classes and, and then as a guest in my classes. And Bob certainly uh, has it. Now, Bob, (laughs) welcome to the Practice Podcast. Let's put, I'll give you the choice. Put the label on you. What are you? (laughs) Label on me. Well, I think that that was a good good way to put it, uh, student. And, you know, Doc, you've had such a huge impression on my career. And, you know, you definitely opened my eyes to the business world in a lot of different ways at Central Connecticut. Um, You made classes fun. And uh, I'll never forget watching Barbershop in your class. That was one of the highlights of my entire college career. Oh, that was your, uh, I had a lot of fun with that, with that, that was movie. a lot of fun. <laughs> and, and you know what? It's, uh, you know, I was a C student, all high school, all college until I got to my business classes. And I, I just, that's when I, I knew what I wanted to do. I, I had such a passion for business and, and helping solve problems. And, you know, today I'm still a student. I just, I learn. I read a ton of books. I network with whoever I can, and and here we are. And I have a company that's that's grown a little bit. So um, it's been been a fun ride. So you're not peeling off the label student. You're adding to it and maybe putting a little glitter on it and have some light shooting out of it because that's what I see. And you showed me just before we started, Bob, that uh, proof in, uh, of concept here that you uh, do a lot of reading and then you. Uh, close that gap between a read and a do very quickly. Uh, and you were uh, revising still again uh, your uh, core concepts and values for uh, impact your business. So what were you reading and how did that influence anything you were putting on in quotes paper yeah. uh, to share with your with your constituents, your employees? Yeah. Uh, leaders are readers. Uh, I definitely learned that from you. I've seen that with other successful coaches and mentors I've had in my life. So I'm, I'm really trying to focus on reading. I think my goal was to do uh, five or six books this quarter, but now I'm already past that. I've already read like 12 books already this year. Uh, but one of the ones that had a huge impact on me was uh, Jim Collins just updated uh, Beyond Entrepreneurship. So this is a, the second uh, version of it. it. Just came out a couple of years ago, and I love Jim Collins. I love all of his concepts, uh, and the model he originally walked through back when this book came out in '94, and, and he kept in this book was how to lay out a vision for your company. And I've seen other models, like Cameron Harold has the vivid vision. I've seen other ways of laying it out, um, but I really like this version. So. Like you said, whenever I try to, whenever I learn something and it applies to me, I do try to critically think and say, how could this apply to my business? I, I try some things. I, some most times I'll never roll anything out. This one I think I will, 
I went through and just followed the steps as they recommended in the book. You know, you start at the highest of high levels. So like, what are the beliefs and the values of the company that will never, ever, ever change? Then you get down to the purpose, which should almost never change. Then you get to your mission or your big, hairy, audacious goal. And it walks all the way through. And like, what are we going to do this year to make this happen? So I just filled out the entire document and uh, it's just a great exercise. But, you know, it's, um, you know, as I look at impact, we, we've got a lot that we want to do over the next five to 10 years. So it's kind of good to see it all on paper. And uh, we're probably going to roll this out to the entire company as a tool that one of the most important things as a leader, and you know this, one of the most important things a leader can do is to communicate the strategy, communicate the culture, the vision, and make sure that everyone sees it as clearly as the leader does uh, and, and can see that through all the way. So you can never communicate a strategy or a vision uh, enough. And that's, that's what I was, I'm also trying to execute here is that that was definitely one of the key concepts of the book. Mm-hmm. And it's something I know I could be doing better as the CEO of Impact. Peter Vale and I, uh, I had a similar student uh, professor relationship a hundred years before you were born, Bob. But uh, what what ignited Peter's interest in his last project, the book that uh, we, I'm just finishing for him, is uh, there's this theory and practice that we we just say theory and then oh and practice oh but theory oh, oh yeah and and people will put it into action. What I see in your uh, new or revised uh, statement is that it's a theory. It's the best thinking you could do initially at this phase of what, about 11 or 12 years, at least that the business has been alive. 13, 13 years. Wonderful. And you, you lay out, you lay it out in abstract. Those are words, they're abstractions. And when you say you want to have your folks read them, they're going to be starting with that theory practice dance, as Peter called it. Oh, yeah, well, let me stick it over here. I'll put something up on the wall. We'll frame it. Or, uh, oh, thank you, Bob. I was hopeful that you see there's another direction, still another direction we can go, but we're not going to stop being who we are at our most fundamental level, which is our beliefs and our values. Yeah. So um, as you move this uh, from the theory of uh, Bob Ruffalo uh, to be executed in the DNA of the practice of the folks who work with uh, your impact company, uh, what are some of the ways you're going to massage that? Or let's put it another way, teach it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, luckily a lot of this stuff is not brand new. Yeah. So we, we've had our purpose statement and we've had our, our values for quite a few years now. Every single person in the company can recite them because we, we've kept them so alive. You know, wh- when we first rolled them out, they were a little weird at, for some people and not everyone can remember it, but we repeated <laughs> it in every meeting and we praise people or, you know, uh, if we have to have tough conversations, it's usually right around our core values. So they're very alive in the company. Um, and I think the last couple of years has definitely been a journey of really discovering what we want the business to be for the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. And luckily that's been not just like me in my own room doing it by myself, you know, a lot of brainstorming sessions with some different teams and, and getting a lot of input from, from a lot of folks. So we started really shaping a lot of this up and that, you know, our mission came out last year, which is 10,000 businesses all over the world thriving with They Ask You Answer. And that's our, our model, They Ask You Answer. It's our, mm-hmm. our framework for sales and marketing. So, you know, we, we came up with that mission last year and then it's like, well, then like, why, why 10,000? How are we going to get to 10,000? How are we going to track 10,000? And, you know, that's what I was trying to answer a little bit when I laid out the strategy was you know, what is the business going to look like in a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, not trying to give too much of the how, because it's not my job to figure out how to do it. It's to, to describe what the company is going to look like at that point. So we could all work towards it. Mm-hmm. And I think to roll this out to your question, it's lots of little conversations. It's starting with some small people that I really trust 
mm-hmm. getting their feedback. And that's actually the, the process I'm in now. Uh, I, I shared this document out with a small handful of folks and got some great feedback and some things I missed. So I'm going back and editing it and I'm having some other people help me do that. Um, but then it's going to be working through it with my management team and my leadership team, making mm-hmm. sure they really, really understand it so they can cascade that down to their teams. And, and certainly, you know, it's probably celebrating when we hit some milestones or if we're mm. doing things that are getting us into the right path to keep it more real throughout the entire company and talking about it and talking about it and talking about it mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and just having a really good discipline approach. But I think luckily we have a lot of people in the company that love our framework, love our model, love what we're doing, love our purpose. Mm-hmm. So none of this is like you have to force them to try to you know, do this. They're already on the right bus. And yeah. No, no, I, I'm with you on that. But I, I also have known you before you started the business for before 13 years ago. And I, I used to, when I was present at the campus, and I could eventually uh, once in a while go down and visit you in one of your several places <laughs> that you, yeah. you set up for uh, people to sit in, and do work. And even that changed oh, yeah. before you and I I uh, couldn't have physical contact. You know, I couldn't come down and put my feet on the floor of your shop. Uh, you were starting to go virtual with because you wanted different talent, uh, talented people who weren't <clears throat> drive in ready, if you will. Yeah. yeah. So you, in many ways, the how, um, the where, <laughs> some of those things have have changed, and I believe you have read uh, the trends because you are such a reader and were able to anticipate when it was time to release, you know, the grip that you would have on the one way of being uh, inbound uh, impact uh, marketers and move to another one. Now, the one that I was pleased to learn about when we first connected a couple of weeks ago was that you have uh, joined uh, Marcus yeah. And the book title, which you can mention any number of times if you wish, <laughs> is uh, essentially the business in, 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 its, in its most manifest sense. Is that not so? That's exactly right. Competition, it was actually one of my strengths. I did the uh, strength mm-hmm. finders and competition ranked really high. Mm-hmm. And I've realized in my career, I always like having a benchmark, whether another company or something that it's like, that's cool, that, that they're awesome. I want to aspire to be that. And when I first started, it was, you know, just be an agency. I looked at other small agencies, like that was my benchmark. After that, it was, you know, bigger agencies that we looked at. And we became the top HubSpot partner agency. And still, I wasn't overly passionate about the work we were doing. We were doing okay work. I thought we could do better. So, you know, knowing Marcus and reading his book and seeing the, the, profound impact that he was having on the small about businesses that he was working with and the people he was talking to in the crowds. And then I was looking at other companies. I was looking at the great game of business, Vern Harnish's company is scaling up, Gino Wickman's company, EOS, StoryBrand was another one. And they had very, very different business models. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is where I came in. I was like, I could take Marcus's framework, which is my, it's right here. And I could take his framework and I can take that business model and I could put it together. I think we can grow this thing to a 25, 50 million, maybe even a hundred million you know, dollar company. And we can service people in so many different ways. And that's where the 10,000 uh, businesses all over the world came in. We could build out a partner network of coaches that mm-hmm. could work with their own clients and help them implement the Ask Me Answer. We can build an online learning community where people can do courses and learn the materials. And uh, so... I, you know, the, the framework is phenomenal. Uh, anyone that's read the book, I know you, you, you're reading it right now and yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it, people rave about it. And when they implement it in their business, and I've seen this hundreds and hundreds of times now, and I've gone to these companies, I've walked their floors and they, they love, they ask me answer so much and they're doing it in their business and their businesses are thriving because of it. Uh, you know, double sales, triple sales coming from their inbound channels, 10 X sometimes. And I'm like, that's the business I want to be in. So my whole yeah. goal now is just to scale this this program, scale this framework. But you held on uh, to who you are. Marcus, uh, repeat his last name, please. Uh, Sheridan. 
Marcus Sheridan. Marcus Sheridan. Uh, as I re, as I've read so far that he uh, basically was managing a pool installation business, a That's fiberglass correct. pool installation business. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, from that, with uh, being, I think, a teacher, from the way I, I read him, he started realizing there were an awful lot of questions, some of which retail businesses charging that amount of money at any point, 2010, whenever, would duck. Yes. Oh, well, uh, we'll talk about price once I get a sales guy out there. We got to measure for all of the dodges that all of us do. And so what I was saying is that the, the gist of what I've read so far and why I think you're you're a good partner with him is the word trust. Yes. It's the entire concept of the, the whole book. It is. And, and, it, and, and way back when you were starting, you had a couple of clients. Uh, was it a construction business or something like that? Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah, it was. I think so. And a contractor. And it was, he, you know, he was struggling to bring in more business. And so you said, well, start writing some um, blogs will help you get them up on your web page. You know, you are you know what you're doing, write some stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suspect that the reaction then was, hey, wait a minute, I'm not a writer. Yes. <laughs> you know, I pour concrete and, and, uh, and move rebars around. And, and what I loved about that story is I learned it way back and I'm seeing the consistency now is anyone can teach as mm -hmm. marcus says anyone can write yes uh yeah. and, and 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 in order to get that much content with your current constituents or followers for this for this idea uh there's a, a this tremendous amount of trust building that has to be done within the yeah. business in order for the customer to be hearing or receiving content from the people who actually do the job who know the job you know, who have frustrations to exactly real right. people. The whole thing is real people. So uh, how, how is that working? How do you make that? How do you convince yeah. someone? You still have the same challenge. And, and you, I mean, you nailed a lot of it. You know, it's the, as consumers in this digital age, and we're not going backwards, we're doing much more of the buying process on our own. And That's right. there's so many different things you can buy nowadays without big purchases that before you'd have to talk to a salesperson and say, you don't have to talk to a salesperson at all. You know, the, the web experiences are going that way. The content is going that way and businesses that lean into that are going to win. And the businesses that say, no, like our website is just a brochure. They need to call us and we're going to go through our sales process. We're going to make them do all this, these, these, you know, go hoops. through all these hoops. Those are the ones that are not going to win. You know? So when someone goes and says, Hey, I'm thinking about getting a fiberglass pool. I, you know, I want to put a pool in my backyard. How much is it going to cost? What do I need? What do I have to consider? What are the problems with it? How does that compare to a cement pool? You know, who are the best people that install pools in my area? And if you are addressing those questions on your website, if you're a pool company, you're going to get found because those articles are going to rank number one. Yeah, they, they pop up in Google. Yeah. You're going to, they're going to land on your website. They're going to learn about it from you. And if you answer it in the most honest and transparent way, not sound like a salesperson, we're all smart now uh, that, you know, our spidey senses go up. We know when someone's just talking marketing speak to us first, really giving us good education. And, uh, and, and again, the, the company that earns the most trust the fastest is going to get that lead. So for example, Marcus, you know, he wrote one article called how much does the fiberglass pool cost when <laughs> he was trying to save his business. And he got over a million dollars in sales from that one article. And had he not written that article, would not have gotten those sales. That's right. He's, he'd still be in Northern Virginia. Uh, well, he probably wouldn't because it's, yeah. I think he's got a lot of energy from what I can read and the way he writes. Uh, but yeah. those are the kind of stories. That, and you yeah. had a number of testimonials like that, which, yeah. believe me, I mean, I read them carefully to see, wait a minute now, uh, are these uh, uh Bob's buddies who are writing him, a, give me something good. No, you wouldn't do that because, uh, yeah, you want people to write their their true uh, estimation of their experience. But on the other hand, you know, it would uh, it would start to ring the other way. And like, oh god, you know these these guys sound great. They write 
this book is great. The, the services they're offering now through uh, Impact sound really good. But there's something wrong here. There's something that isn't quite right. So that is the consumer, too. Yeah. What I call the squinted eye. It was funny because my folks, uh, grandfather, uncle, dad, uh, both uncles actually were all in main business back in the 50s, 60s in 70s and they um they believed and i think i probably preached this in my classes they believed that reputation in maine mm -hmm. was the only way you could put food on the table that yes. everything else had to yeah. comport with reputation because it was a maine was a small town back then and so one of the little lessons that i remember my dad uh would tell me is he said watch for the squinted eye the one eye squint, or we used to call it the hairy eyeball. <laughs> You're talking to someone, you can see their eyes back then. <laughs> and I think there are ways to squint your eyes digitally now in, in, uh, in the web experience. But there was like, okay, what's the catch? Remember that? Yep. What's the catch? And I think it's given uh, business um, an earned bad rap over, over the decades. You're, you're seeing it differently. You and Marcus see a better future if people tell the truth now yeah. back to the question how do you get the content how do you get people who aren't just your your staff writer or whatever a company might put out there to to uh, put their thoughts down yeah so one of the things about they ask you answer really just digital marketing in general you know there's no magic pill uh, the companies that win, it's not like they just do, you know, one thing really smart and they back off. It's, it's hard. It's, it's a lot of work. Uh, and, you know, even our clients, when they first come on with us, we are very clear, like, there's a process you have to follow. You must follow this process. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a lot of work. If you're willing to do the work, it will work for you. We go, we go pretty much guarantee you're going to have incredible marketing results if you do all the things you're supposed to do. And to, to, you're right, it's, you have to have a, a content writer on staff if this is going to work. Um, you get a journalist right out of school, uh, but all of our clients, the first thing we do is we require them to hire a content manager that, whose only job is to create content for that business. And get the content from the various people who are in the know, right? It's not and that they're exactly doing right. all the writing. Is that we what like we journalists, not yeah. just writers, but we like journalists because journalists go to school to mm -hmm. learn how to interview and extract information mm -hmm. so they could put it together into a really well thought out piece that is educational and informative. Mm -hmm. So that is usually the pipeline. So the, the hundred clients that we're working with right now, they all have a content manager on staff and that content manager is being trained by our team to create content that's going to work for search. It's going to work to build trust. It's going to drive conversions, but they, so they have to do it a very particular way. Um, but that's to make it or break it. Every single time one of our clients hires, our con hires a content manager that really wants to do well, they have a lot of energy. They love writing. They love, it, it could be in any industry and the business just takes off. I mean, the stats just go through the roof. So, so that sounds um, like a, a practice of the future. I, I love yeah. that idea because I know there are a lot of uh, very gifted uh, writers who are generalists and who would like to see the results more closely than someone who writes a newspaper article or other kinds of writing. Yeah. But I want to get to another question because, um, and the question is the question. I, I, I know I have to finish the book and I apologize for not getting it all the way through before oh, today, yeah. but I was curious about how do you know what the asking how do you how does a, a client or anyone who's used yeah. how do they know that the question's been asked before it becomes content or as close to it as possible it's very easy oh you know, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of marketing companies will tell you hey you gotta go to do buyer personas and hire us to do research and talk to your audience mm -hmm. but we we take another side of that like you already know the questions you have a sales team if you've been in business uh -huh. and you're selling things uh -huh. You already know the questions. So talk to your sales team. What questions are you being asked all the time? They'll mm -hmm. tell you. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we have somewhere we recommend for, for everybody. It's, we call it the big five. You know, it's, it's how much does it cost, the comparisons, the reviews, the problems, and what are the best, right? Those are the top five. We call it the big five. 
mm-hmm. almost in every industry, people are asking those questions. Mm-hmm. So you can address those first, but then it's like, just talk to your sales team. They, they know they're, they write the same emails all the time. Mm-hmm. They're, they're answering the same things in every conversation. So what we always advise is start with the questions your sales team gets. Those are the questions that people are actively buying right now or asking. Yeah. So you start there. Um, and uh, so that, that makes it really easy if you're talking to your sales team saying, you know, what what content could we write so you don't have to answer the same question over and over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, so there's a constant debriefing. And if, if they're really salespeople, they'll also be uh, scouting on their own and trying to exp- expand their uh, potential leads. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it seems that uh, you're not only getting one of the current buyers asking, but really astute salespeople will be um, reading. <laughs> they'll be looking, they'll be looking at the trends they'll be, and they'll be doing a heck of a lot of listening. And when companies do this well, even if they just do inbound marketing well, but they ask you answer tends to be a, a system that you can use to make inbound marketing work. Many of our clients, they don't have to prospect anymore because they have so many good qualified inbound leads coming through their website that their sales team just responds to the inbound leads. So for like impact, you know, the only leads that we prospect are from our database, from the people that are on our website, downloading our content. We don't have to go get cold leads and try to educate them on inbound and they ask your answer because they already know that they're way deeper in their buying process. So, um, so again, that's, that's one of the major benefits of just yeah. inbound marketing in general, but certainly they ask your answer. Yeah, It, it closes the gap very quickly, very um, so. but it is about the future and it's never yeah. about what we did and what uh, before and what yeah. we're doing at this moment, but it has that future aspect to it. But you have, I think you have the, uh, the kinds of evidence uh, that is um, more quickly absorbed and to inspire action. You know, so you do have those old, the old, what I now think of as old fashioned marketing techniques where they, you know, bring in charts and data uh, management runs and all the rest. And you're kind of waiting to, to, you know, for something to light up in your heart, <laughs> you know, like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. That's so if it's coming through your sales folks and they're part of their, in their, they're in the community of your company, they're not outsourced or, or somehow mm-hmm. separate uh, so that they're, they're, it's a conversation That's with right. a big C, then the action takers, the ones who can make the changes in the product that's receiving the most concerns or the pricing or the delivery time and all of that, are in the conversation or am I imposing that idea on you, Bob, or is that the no, way you see it? <laughs> that's exactly right. And, and you know, in, in most organizations that we see, at least before we start working with them, you got marketing over here, you got sales over here. When mm-hmm. when sales aren't happening, the sales team is blaming marketing and marketing is blaming sales. So one of the simplest things we do is we put them together. Mm-hmm. You know, they need to be working hand in hand together. And we teach them how to make that happen. And they have a regular meeting called a revenue team meeting. And they're talking about the things that marketing could be doing to support them and vice versa. So they're working as one collective unit. But you're, you're exactly right when you say that. When the, the two operate in silos, mm-hmm. it, you, know, it, it, you know, there's so much missed opportunity there. Now, there's another aspect of every company beyond those two um, uh, elements, and that is mm-hmm. the the makers, <laughs> yeah. uh, the the service deliverers, the ones who who uh, are whose actions are resulting in raising questions for customers. Yes, and so they have to be in on the game too. Don't they are they? too. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Product yeah. managers, whoever. That's, yeah, you're exactly right. Mm-hmm. Now I want to go to you <laughs> because uh, and uh, the student label, by the way, just got bigger on my screen now, Rob, because you are you are a student of even what your business is accomplishing now. You study that uh, and and translate it into not only the new policies that you're writing up at the moment, but translate it into almost everyday connections with uh, just about anyone. How have you changed uh, in the last 13 years as a result of what your learning path has taken you on? Yeah. 
A lot. Um, you know, being, being an entrepreneur uh, can be stressful. Um, it's not easy. Uh, certainly isn't for everybody. And, you know, when I first started my career, I had no idea what I was doing. I've never <laughs> walked these shoes before. And anyone that would tell you that they were just natural at it and came easy to them and they, they had the Rolex and the nice car and, you know, they're probably lying that it's not an easy road. <laughs> you know, certainly it hasn't been for me. Anything I've learned, it's because I failed two or three or four or five times before I finally stopped like doing the same stupid things over and over again, just <laughs> figured I had not do so many stupid things. Um, you know, when I was younger and I was in my late twenties, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I had no leadership skills. You know, we had grown the company maybe 15 people. Mm -hmm. I, I was irrational at times. I was emotional. Yeah, you know, I meant well, um, but I would take out my frustrations in ways I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. um, my team likes to call out the old Bob. <laughs> you know, I love that. And you know, I had a, a couple of people that you know I was close with, I was friends with, and they they got me. They didn't think my behavior was acceptable, but they cared enough about me to you know, talk to me about it. And that led me to start reading more about how to be a better leader. And I went and I did a 360 survey. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was a big pivotal moment for me because I realized like the things I, I was really feeling deep down inside, what I cared so about. I, I had my team a lot of my me the same way because my I, actions I, I were coming older. across that way. I wasn't very and, uh, now I wasn't 70 honest people. and open with them all the time. And I still have a lot to learn. So I still I had to change mistakes. a lot of my ways I, you know, as I as I got a little older. I tend older. to be very aggressive in and, terms uh, of now like, we're 70 what I people want to do with the business. And I still have a lot to learn. I still make big mistakes. worldwide. I tend to be very aggressive in terms of there's no roadmap what I want to do with the business. It hasn't been done. It's not like someone's going to buy a playbook and say, I'm just going to follow this. Right? Figure it out, and you know, there's no roadmap for that. You know, a lot of things we're doing has some balance. It's not like someone's going to buy a playoff and say, "I'm going to follow this to T." You got to figure it out. A lot of things we tried figuring it out means weren't the right ones. You know, I'm going to take some bets, and some of them are going to at the end of the day still okay. Fail because now, and you know, way more experience. We tried the last couple years. My whole team the right way more experience, and we're going to make better decisions than before because of all. At the end of the day, it's still okay because now. I'm way more experienced. We we're but my whole team were way more experienced, and we're gonna make better decisions moving forward because of all that. This the label is now Bob, the new student, or the new student who is who Bob. fails a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know that you are always uh, thinking about entrepreneurial and reading about it as as you would with Jim Collins's book. It's it's not an entrepreneurial act if the results are highly predictable. That's right. And I think maybe it was Collins who said fail forward or someone did, but uh, but we don't really condition um, our students in the business schools, I don't think, and Peter didn't either, to appreciate how important it'll be to become superb learners yeah. on your own <laughs> to the grade book is closed, to become and remain superb learners. And the only reason you have to learn something is that you don't know it <laughs> and you don't know what you don't know until until something hits you alongside the head. And then you do grab for the best ideas you can get. Hopefully, a lot of them are in print. A lot of them aren't. And, and as you say, that that page of the playbook hasn't been written yet. And that's I used to uh, tell my friends, hey, you got to you got to check out what Bob Ruffalo is doing. Because I, I don't know, people see here inbound and they think it's a bus coming into a station or a train. And it's not. It's a whole, it's a mind shift. It's a paradigm shift of how you um, earn customers and keep them. And, uh, and you were really out on that edge. And sure, it must have gotten scary at times. It was your nickel in the game uh, for a lot of those times. And you did go ahead and create a uh, a, a network you had conferences mm -hmm. uh around uh helping people become better at inbound marketing are you yeah. still doing any of that or have you shifted most of your your bet to the uh working with um, marcus's book well no it's all it's all one the same so yeah i mean the whole business is around the ask you answer and how we execute on that could be in a lot of different uh different ways mm -hmm. so uh, events are still gonna be part of our strategy 
right now it's very difficult and yeah and very hard still can't pull people together yeah yeah you know we we had two conferences planned we had one for the beginning of april that we were on pace to do about a uh, thousand attendees which was a big milestone for us mm-hmm. and we had to cancel it because the first wave of covid when things started uh opening back up we started planning a second one and then we had to cancel that because of uh oh my <laughs> yeah. so we're a little skittish towards you know what we're going to do for events in the future but yeah i still believe in community i still believe in the power of bringing people together Mm-hmm. I definitely believe in like full immersive learning experiences. So, you know, we're looking at other ways we can do it. Virtual is good, but there's so much virtual and, and people just want to get off of Zoom. They don't want to be on Zoom all day anymore. So the skin, the skin to skin. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I honestly could not have. I know that I couldn't have uh, been the professor I was if if I had to jump uh, totally online as my colleagues did two years ago. It was horrific for many people. And I was, I was running a blended class. I was very adept at using the learning management system, but it was, it was to make, uh, the classroom moment, uh, richer by having all of that material available to them and teaching them, you read this on your own, you know, you, you can ignore it or you can read it. Uh, but, deliver the answers when I pose the questions or when life poses the questions. So I was modeling that, but you're right. I would have had a hard time and I've stayed in, in a network with organizational behavior teachers and others. And I've, I've really felt for them. They've got the same challenge you, you have as, as someone who really does see the value of bringing people together, you know, shaking a hand and all of that. And someday that hopefully will come. Uh, we're going to do, we're going to do, I think, in the, the upcoming months, we're going to do more events, but smaller events. Yeah. Yeah. That way they're a little less risky. Mm-hmm. I think the, the hard part was we were trying to use, you know, beautiful convention centers and have big audiences and big, you know, displays and everything and do something really, really cool. But I just don't think we're, I don't think the times really are. Um, it's not, it's not a good time to, to be playing that. So, and they're come hun- back down the road. Literally hundreds of venues who would crave to have, you know, two or 300 people as opposed to a thousand or even a hundred. And, and you can really, it's, it's, it's more uh, time consuming for you and your team. But on the other hand, if we want to go to what are they asking yes. on the ask before you answer, it does give you more chance to listen to what your, your customers, uh, the folks uh, who want to become more effective marketers uh, are, are, what are their questions? And a lot of them have to do with the fact that everything uh, Humpty Dumpty was pushed off the wall. Uh, Humpty being, you name the institution, healthcare, business, higher education, K-12. And we're now trying to put the pieces back together again. And uh, that wasn't a very good ending for, for the Humpty story, but yeah. I'm optimistic. Uh, what are you excited about now, Bob, as we're closing up on the last couple of minutes? A lot of things, a lot of things. Um, I'm excited for our vision. Uh, I'm excited for the businesses that we get to work with. Uh, I'm, I love the people I work with. I, I have such a great team and that's what gets me really up every, every day. Um, we have a lot of fun and we're doing work that matters. So I, I just look at, you know, the next three to five years and if I'm, if I'm passionate about what I'm doing, I'm having fun with the people I'm doing and, you know, we're, we're, you know, moving the business forward. That's, that's all I'm looking forward to. It's, it's staying the course more than anything. It's been, it's been a long journey to find the right course. Now that we have it, now we got to stay on it. Stay on it. (laughs) Now, let me see your wrist. Do I see a Rolex there? No, No. you'll see an Apple watch. (laughs) An Apple watch. All right. Well, that's even more pragmatic. Uh, (laughs) So you do want to make a nice living as would anyone, but it sounds to me like you really want the greater benefit of being uh, a business founder who's now moving uh, your business into its teenage years. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Well, any one question for me before we go? Anything you were curious about? From I have a statement, Doc. Okay. You know, I, I I just want to thank you um, 
probably on behalf of all your, your past students, you know, I don't know if anyone cares as much about their students as, as much as you do. And, you know, you brought so much to every single class and, you know, the impact that you've had on the business community in Connecticut, you know, when I, when I talk about my experience at Central, I talk about my, my favorite business classes. I'm always talking about your class and, and anyone that's ever been a student feels the same exact way. So many people have gone on to do so many great things in this state and they were students of yours and you had an impact on them. So I just want you to know how grateful I am to have had you as a mentor in my life and everything that you've done for the state and for that university. You just are one of the best people in the world. So thank you for everything you've done. Wow. <laughs> I actually, believe it or not, I'm almost speechless, but thank you. And I agree with you. I put everything I could into and still do as much as I can sitting here in New, way up in New Hartford, Connecticut. But thanks to Zoom and thanks to you, we've we've reconnected and let's stay in connection. I will uh, happily finish uh, Marcus's book, and I want I own now the Jim Collins book, and I uh, I'll just just keep on. I'll put my student label on. You got yours on. We're in school. Thanks, Bob. Thank you so much, Doc. If you'd like to hear more, listen in on Spotify, Automatic, and Apple Podcasts, or go to inactionresearch.com slash podcast dash page. And if you'd like to learn more about social inaction and the nature of practice, head over to inactionresearch.com for more information. Thank you for supporting this show. We look forward to hearing from you soon.